This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Water Ghost of Harrowby Hall by John Kendrick Bangs Read by John Taylor, Southeast Missouri, September 2006 The trouble with Harrowby Hall was that it was haunted. What was worse, the ghost did not content itself with merely appearing at the bedside of the afflicted person who saw it, but persisted in remaining there for one mortal hour before it would disappear. It never appeared except on Christmas Eve, and then as the clock was striking twelve, in which respect alone was it lacking in that originality which in these days is a sine qua non of success in spectral life. The owners of Harrowby Hall had done their utmost to rid themselves of the damp and dewy lady who rose up out of the best bedroom floor at midnight, but without avail. They had tried stopping the clock so that the ghost would not know when it was midnight, but she made her appearance just the same, with that fearful, miasmatic personality of hers. And there she would stand until everything about her was thoroughly saturated. Then the owners of Harrowby Hall cocked up every crack in the floor with the very best quality of hemp, and over this were placed layers of tar and canvas. The walls were made waterproof, and the doors and windows likewise, the proprietors having conceived the notion that the unexercised lady would find it difficult to leak into the room after these precautions had been taken. But even this did not suffice. The following Christmas Eve she appeared as promptly as before, and frightened the occupant of the room quite out of his senses by sitting down alongside of him and gazing with her cavernous blue eyes into his, and he noticed, too, that in her long, aqueously bony fingers bits of dripping seaweed were entwined, the ends hanging down, and these ends she drew across his forehead until he became like one insane and then he swooned away and was found unconscious in his bed the next morning by his host, simply saturated with seawater and fright from the combined effects of which he never recovered, dying four years later of pneumonia and nervous prostration at the age of seventy-eight. The next year the master of Harrowby Hall decided not to have the best spare bedroom opened at all thinking that perhaps the ghost's thirst for making herself disagreeable would be satisfied by haunting the furniture. But the plan was as unavailing as the many that had preceded it. The ghost appeared as usual in the room. That is, it was supposed she did, for the hangings were dripping wet the next morning, and in the parlor below the haunted room a great damp spot appeared on the ceiling. Finding no one there, she immediately set out to learn the reason why and she chose none other to haunt than the owner of the Harrowby himself. She found him in his own cozy room drinking whiskey, whiskey undiluted, and felicitating himself upon having foiled her ghost ship, when all of a sudden the curl went out of his hair, his whiskey bottle filled and overflowed, and he was himself in a condition similar to that of a man who has fallen into a water butt. When he recovered from the shock, which was a painful one, he saw before him the lady of the cavernous eyes and seaweed fingers. The sight was so unexpected and so terrifying that he fainted but immediately came to, because of the vast amount of water in his hair, which trickling down over his face restored his consciousness. Now it so happened that the master of Harrowby was a brave man and while he was not particularly fond of interviewing ghosts, especially such quenching ghosts as the one before him, he was not to be daunted by an apparition. He had paid the lady the compliment of feigning from the effects of his first surprise, and now that he had come to he intended to find out a few things he felt he had a right to know. He would have liked to put on a dry suit of clothes first, but the apparition declined to leave him for an instant until her hour was up and he was forced to deny himself that pleasure. Every time he would move, she would follow him, with the result that everything she came in contact with got a ducking. 
In an effort to warm himself up, he approached the fire. An unfortunate move, as it turned out, because it brought the ghost directly over the fire, which was immediately extinguished. The whiskey became utterly valueless as a comforter to his chilled system, because it was by this time diluted to a proportion of ninety percent of water. The only thing he could do to ward off the evil effects of his encounter he did, and that was to swallow ten two-grain quinine pills which he managed to put into his mouth before the ghost had time to interfere. Having done this, he turned with some asperity to the ghost and said, Far be it from me to be impolite to a woman, madam, but I'm hanged if it wouldn't please me better if you'd stop these infernal visits of yours to this house. Go sit out on the lake if you like that sort of thing. Soak the water butt if you wish, but do not, I implore you, come into a gentleman's house and saturate him and his possessions in this way. It is damned disagreeable. Henry Hartwick Oglethorpe, said the ghost in a gurgling voice, you don't know what you are talking about. Madam, returned the unhappy householder, I wish that remark was strictly truthful. I was talking about you. It would be shillings and pence, nay, pounds in my pocket, madam, if I did not know of you. That is a bit of specious nonsense, returned the ghost, throwing a cord of indignation into the face of the master of Harrowby. It may rank as high as repartee, but as a comment upon my statement that you do not know what you are talking about, it savors of irrelevant impertinence. You do not know that I am compelled to haunt this place year after year by inexorable fate. It is no pleasure to me to enter this house and ruin and mildew everything I touch. I never aspired to be a shower-bath, but it is my doom. Do you know who I am? No, I don't, returned the master of Harrowby. I should say you were the Lady of the Lake, or little Sally Waters. You are a witty man for your years, said the ghost. Well, my humor is drier than yours will ever be, returned the master. No doubt. I am never dry. I am the water-ghost of Harrowby Hall, and dryness is a quality entirely beyond my wildest hope. I have been the incumbent of this highly unpleasant office for two hundred years to-night. How the deuce did you ever come to get elected? asked the master. Through a suicide, replied the spectre. I am the ghost of that fair maiden whose picture hangs over the mantelpiece in the drawing-room. I should have been your great-great-great-great-great-aunt if I had lived, Henry Hartwick Oglethorpe, for I was the own sister of your great-great-great-great-grandfather. But what induced you to get this house into such a predicament? I was not to blame, sir, returned the lady. It was my father's fault. He it was who built Harrowby Hall, and the haunted chamber was to have been mine. My father had it furnished in pink and yellow, knowing well that blue and gray formed the only combination of color I could tolerate. He did it merely to spite me, and with what I deem a proper spirit, I declined to live in the room, whereupon my father said I could live there or on the lawn, he didn't care which. That night I ran from the house and jumped over the cliff into the sea. That was rash, said the master of Harrowby. So I've heard, returned the ghost. If I had known what the consequences were to be, I should not have jumped. But I never really realized what I was doing, until after I was drowned. I had been drowned a week, when a sea-nymph came to me and informed me that I was to be one of her followers for ever afterwards, adding that it should be my doom to haunt Harrowby Hall for one hour every Christmas Eve throughout the rest of eternity. I was to haunt that room on such Christmas Eves as I found it inhabited, and if it should turn out not to be inhabited, I was, and am, to spend the allotted hour with the head of the house. I'll sell the place. That you cannot do, for it is also required of me that I shall appear as the deeds are to be delivered.